big honor for us to be here. Thank you for hosting us. Sandy, my first impression. Huge premises. Yeah. Tell me some of the things that you're doing here. Well, uh, the huge premises is about um, uh, 47,000 square feet or 4,000 square meters. And um, uh, as you can see right here, we're looking at a uh, three-wheel vehicle. This seems to be really, really popular right now. I don't know what, um, what seems to be pushing this, but uh, we have, this is an American uh, uh, contingency that, uh, that we're working on here. Actually, it's not a secret. It's Archimoto that, uh, that asked right. us to work with them. Right. And then we've got two others that are in the design phase, and uh, we're just working out the details. But this one here will be able to help out, you know, reducing the, uh, the cost and the complexity and probably improve the quality a fair amount. But mm. the other two are luckier because they're in the design phase. So um, the design phase means that we can, um, we can make a lot better, a better choices because these are all new product development is where we really can make a significant difference. And, and the difference is based on stuff like this. Like when you're looking at this, I mean, this is pretty much every electric motor that's worth a damn uh, in, uh, in the world uh, sitting I mean, right here. So this is, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that our customers rely on us to tell them which is the right direction as far as, you know, what's, what's the trends, which do we see that's less expensive, which one's giving us the lightest weight and whatnot. And actually, one of the things is that, uh, that we've noticed is that weight and, uh, and cost are, are like, a, like a straight line. It's amazing. Um, you don't see that with, uh, with engines, uh, but you do see that with, uh, with traction motors. So this is, uh, this is kind of a big deal. So at the end of the day, the other thing that's making a big, uh, big difference is uh, these uh, inverters. Mm. Inverters, the, uh, the DC-DC power things, uh, power uh, converters, those, those things seem to be the, the, big, uh, the big changes. And then you've got, <clears throat> you know, in some cases, there's guys running with a two-speed motor. Most everybody has just got a right. one-speed, but single speed. But, single speed. but, but in, in the case of what are we going to do to increase uh, the speed or, or change, uh, change the characteristics so that I can get low-end torque and, uh, and speed as well, these are the things that are making the difference. And then yes. over here, this is... a. <laughs> This is like, uh, we had to do scanning this time. Normally we don't do that, but uh, this customer needed it. So, okay, fine. They gave us a scanner, told us uh, what they wanted done, and then our guys did it. But we would have never, uh, under normal circumstances, gone to that. It's much cheaper to buy it from somebody else. Well, but nobody was working. It's all about so. this, right? It's all about Tesla. Yeah. And it's impressive that, you know, you, it's not yeah. just the Model Y. You've done the Model 3 as well, right? Right, the Model 3. And then we've looked at some of the other things that, mm. uh, that Tesla's been putting out. Um, to make sure that we understand which direction. In fact, one of the things that we're going to be looking at, I didn't mention it there, but we're actually going to be looking at a, a motor that, uh, that runs at, at 100,000 RPMs. <clears throat> it's, using a, um, it's using a different formula as far as the bearings and stuff like that. So when I was in a machine tool world, we had... Uh, we had uh, bearings that, like for high-speed machining and whatnot, those bearings, <laughs> after 60, 70,000 RPM, they go to air bearings. So it really, there's no bearing there. It's an air uh, uh, driving the, uh, the, the spindle. And that gives you the ultimate, the ultimate uh, low friction, if you like. So we think that there's stuff in here for, uh, oh, actually, I think it's time for us to be here. Absolutely I think we're starting Sunday. up. <clears throat> yeah, but anyway, that, that's, that's what's coming up. So um, anyway, 30 what? 30, 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Okay. All, all right. right. Good. Sandy, you ready to rock and roll? Uh, let me just open my cap so <laughs> I don't spill all over myself and look I foolish. Let me have one. <clears throat> yep. Should I button up? Give us if, the if signal. If it fits. If it fits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you look a little tight there. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, just good. a little tight. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, good. I've lost weight, so go ahead. Excellent. So, first of all... Three, two. Perfect. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you are. First of all, let me start by saying it's an absolute honor, not just to present this to my clients who I know is listening into this, but most importantly, doing this with a very close friend of mine, Sandy. So, Sandy, 
Thanks a lot for having us, and especially in your premises. Mm. It's a big, big honor. And just coming back to the topic, I think there's a lot of things that Sandy and me discussed, but what is the one thing that we wanted to tell and we wanted to narrate, which is absolutely relevant for our time right now? And there was nothing better than Tesla. Mm. And for me, I think the message is this is, by the way, I have not invested in Tesla. I'm not a Tesla advocate. But what both Sandy and me are, are we are automotive advocates. And I think it's very important to understand what makes this company tick. What makes this company five to six years ahead of what its nearest competition is. And that's what we want to advocate over here is what makes Tesla a unique engine and what gives them the edge compared to the other competitors that we see out there. So we've got a small agenda for you. We want to make it highly interactive. It's going to fluctuate between research consulting to live demonstration of the Model Y and the Model 3 teardown. So how do we want to start this? And this is what Sandy and me were talking about, is when you look at Tesla, it's not the company that you need to look at. It goes to a very famous uh, series called Suits, and I'm a big fan of this character called Harvey Specter. And he talks about playing the game of poker in a very unique way. When you play a game of poker, don't play the game. It's important to play the player. And that's what Sandy and me talked about is, if you have to understand Tesla, what the strategy is, what their moves are, you need to understand the chess moves that likely that one single entity or that single person in this case, Elon, is going to make. So what is it about? I think the best way to do that is to look at this slide. And some of the things that we have noticed is the automotive industry, they seem to be judging Tesla on two extreme spectrums. One from the automotive spectrum and one from the tech spectrum. Both have merits, but we believe Tesla is much about that because the byproduct of what they're doing is disrupting the automotive and the tech industry. So to really start that journey, it starts from the change in their vision statement. They've moved from being sustainable transportation of which car is a very big part of the puzzle. And they have moved towards sustainable energy of which car is only part of the equation. It's part of the jigsaw. Then in that venture, what is he trying to do? For us, it's very simple. We believe he's trying to create a new industry. And honestly, I think <coughs> between Sandy and me, lack of a better word, we call it networked energy. Let me try and explain what that means. You have to fundamentally understand that these gigafactories need to be equated like oil refineries. And the reason why I say that is, when you look at companies like Chevron and Shell, they are not evaluated by the amount of oil produced, but rather by the number of oil refineries that they have. So in the same way, when you look at these gigafactories, it is wrong to isolate this just to cars or battery production. We believe any tech, any product that is going to be core to the brand of Tesla, but they have the capacity to produce that in the 10 to the power 6, can be equated as gigafactories. So on one hand, you have these oil refineries. The charging stations need to be looked exactly like that as petrol bunks. Now, while the presentation doesn't want to talk about SpaceX in general, I think this is a very important angle that they're going to. It's trying to create networks, not just using the vehicle as the base, but also the infrastructure. And they're after one thing. And we believe that's the customer ID. They want to create an ecosystem. So no matter where the Tesla customer goes, whether that's Tesla Energy, Tesla Mobility, Tesla Infrastructure, or Tesla Connectivity, you will always experience the Tesla brand. And you just have to think about it. Look at the successful companies out there. Of course, they haven't done it overnight, but the successful companies are those that have managed to create an immersive ecosystem. And in that process, really help their customer to transition from one phase to another. We believe that's what Tesla is doing. But that's all great, that's a theory. Today, what we want to focus about is how does it impact the automotive industry? And we believe these are the seven things that he's trying to address. First and foremost, we believe the true disruption he's trying to do, and he's already created, which is giving him that four to five years edge, 
is he's built up the operating system from ground. Why this is important? Because everyone's stating that they want to move from the hardware to the software model, or they want to have customer experience or user interface at the center. I think there's a lot of other challenges you will encounter unless you address the elephant in the room. And that's about how do you own an immersive operating system? Point number two is the chip. I feel the automotive industry is asking the wrong question. Of course, Tesla is a tech company. They can create a chip. But the question really to ask is, why the hell is he doing this? And from that comes some evidence about how it's edge cased and use case based. Last but not least that what we want to talk about is that million mile warranty. This is important because what he's disrupting here is the TCO proposition to customers. It's, it'll even go to the stage where it'll be financially insane not to own a Tesla ever again. While these three information are part of three different sections of a heterogeneous society, it is important because we're living in a time today, <coughs> not just because of COVID, not just because of the political situation, the opinions have never been more divided. But what we see Tesla do in its own way, and especially address this heterogeneous society through this immersive ecosystem that they're creating. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the show that we have for you today, is we want to talk about these four or five pillars, not just talk about it from a, a theory perspective, we want to actually show you some practical evidences of this. And then that way, Sandy, once again, a big thank you. If it was a normal situation, I would have given you a fist bump, but we'll <laughs> refrain from that, okay? Yeah. All right. So. so. So let me start with the first one, and I think what this will very much be is not just a Frost and Sullivan show, it needs to be a Monroe show as well. So let me start with the first and the most important one. And that's what we call as the ground up operating system. Three messages. You looked at the left-hand side, that is how the traditional industry operates. Or let's say, choose to operate. And on the right-hand side, you have the Tesla model. Here's the distinction. Or let me talk about the commonness. The commonness is each of them work on a domain base. There's infotainment, there's telematics, there's ARAS, and there's powertrain. But the issue is, each of these domains have their own operating system. Add to that complexity, each of these operating system have a different origin. Like the infotainment, it comes from the smart mode industry. Or you look at the ADAS, there are evidences show that this is coming from the chip industry or even from the aerospace and defense industry. All fine. But when we look at what's happening now, especially in the connected automotive world, one of the key features that's being enabled to connect to customers is over the air updates. No issues whatsoever on the left hand side. But the issue comes when there's backward compatibility. 60 to 70% of the engineer's time is spent in integrating an update that happens in one chamber, for example, infotainment, and ensuring that that update stocks with the operating system of another domain area. That is drastically different from what Tesla does. Tesla never designed the vehicle with the peripheral point in view. They started with the operating system. And that's the beauty with Tesla is there is one ground operating system on which every domain is built. Both achieve OTA, but the pace and the agility with which the right-hand model does is what gets Tesla the edge. The industry may understand the right-hand model, and they may choose to shift towards this. Among all the announcements that I saw, the one that excited me recently was the Daimler-NVIDIA partnership. There were so many things said, but what I love that the CEO mentioned is the core is to build one operating system that cuts across all domains. Absolutely right. But here's the issue. Doing this is not easy. And the best example I can give you is that of Huawei. Huawei is a tech company. They had the Android operating system and you know what happened with the security issues. They had to migrate to their own. Long story short, you can see from the feedback from the consumers, it's not the same. The experience isn't the same. So when a tech industry faces this issue, the automotive industry is not agnostic to it. But there's a third and a more important point, and that is what, in my opinion, gives a company like Tesla an edge. They go with this model and they try to recruit the best software talent from a university. 
And in that campus, you have an Apple, you have a Google, you have a Tesla, and you have a traditional automotive OEM. Where do you think they're going to go? Where do you think the software engineers are going to go? The answer is on the, left hand, on the right hand side. Simply because when an engineer sees the left hand model, he sees an internal challenge. He sees bureaucracy to solve. But if you look on the right hand side, a software engineer sees a world problem. He sees a business case. He sees an edge case to solve. And that is what Tesla provides the motivation to solve a world problem which will make it a better place. And in my opinion, this operating system is really the edge that Tesla has. It's not the batteries and the other things. The first core thing that they owned is the operating system. But I'm sure the next part is going to excite you because, Sandy, it's not just about operating systems or software, <coughs> is it? That's it's true. much more. That's true. Um, actually, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that I think uh, that's different about Tesla than everybody else is, uh, number one, um, they, they like the idea of going to vertical integration. Um, most every other car company, except for maybe Toyota, Honda, and, uh, and VW, um, every other car company has been drinking the Kool-Aid, as it were, saying that what we need to do is outsource. We need to outsource, outsource. Well, that's fine, but if you don't make it, you don't understand it. And so that's the first thing that I see different about Tesla than everybody else. And the second is, they don't have customers, they have a cult. They have a cult. People absolutely flat out um, are devoted and dedicated to the products. And so uh, Elon Musk asks for information to come back to him. He wants, he wants his ideas to come from the people who, uh, um, who, who, who buy his cars. Who, uh, who are loyal followers, not just customers. Right. And so what I'd like to do is let's go over here to the body Absolutely, Sandy. And, uh, and we'll do a little, little bit of talking. So um, we, um, we were very critical of Tesla um, when we first, uh, when we first um, started working on their vehicles, when we did the Model 3. I mean, everything that was conventional about a, uh, everything that was conventional about a car company was, uh, was missed or, or, or wasn't part of the action, as it were, when it, came to, when it came to their car. The gaps were horrific. The weld spatter was everywhere. I mean, nothing fit. I, I, I mean, I, I criticized their, their, their products heavily because they didn't match what I was used to seeing. I wasn't used to seeing anything that was so poorly built from a, from a car company. And then we lifted off the top hat, and started looking at what Tesla is really all about, which is, as Benny just said, the electronics, the motors, the batteries, the connectivity, all the things that really and truly make a difference to this batch of people, Tesla people, and other people don't care about, the ones that are looking for, is there a good gaps? Do the doors close nice? They, those two groups are diametrically opposite. So if we look at this, this is the Model Y, we saw a vast difference between the Model Y and the Model 3. The Model 3 we thought was pretty much junk. And we made a lot of comments about why it was that that car really shouldn't even be on the road. This car, they took a lot of suggestions. One of the suggestions that we had when we looked at the Model 3 was, why are there over 170 parts to make up this rear end? I mean, that's ridiculous. Little teeny patches welded uh, using self-piercing uh, self, uh, self rivets, self-piercing rivets going this way, that way, whichever way. Just ridiculous, just a, a ridiculous, and then glue, it was everywhere. We, we suggested that hey, you know what, you, you should be making this, uh, this rear quarter area here for the wheel wells. It, it, this could be one piece. Um, and this is the mega casting, <clears throat> one of them. There's two mega castings that are joined together, and that's what basically makes up the whole rear end of the car. And we had suggested X, but they, they gave us X squared when they came up with this. This is the big, one of the biggest castings we've ever seen, certainly the biggest casting we've seen in a, in, a, in a car company. 
This is just spectacular. And not only did they do what we said was getting rid of the wheel inner and turning it into something new, they, this thing's got all kinds of stuff. The, uh, the shocks are, are made for, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, the shock and suspension system already built in. All kinds of little areas where I don't have to have a secondary operation to put in a clamp or something. It's all built right into the casting. This is brilliant. And one of the things that I really went crazy on was the, um, was the, uh, the little well, if you like, that, uh, that I said, this should be one piece and it should be made out of plastic. You know what? Normally, if we give criticism, there's going to be an engineer that has what we call the ugly baby syndrome. Don't tell my baby, don't call my baby ugly. Well, if we look at this, obviously, they don't care about ugly babies. This is one piece, and I'm pretty sure that now, uh, if, you, uh, if you go in and have a look at a, at a Tesla Model 3, you're going to find that's been made into a plastic part. They don't stand still. And they don't care about, they have no pride when it comes to making the change. They're not, uh, they're, they're interested in making sure that the product is as good as it can possibly be. So that's one feature. But then let's, let's talk about some of the innovation. So if we, uh, if we look at this, this is the octo valve. And, um, and this is really kind of a brilliant thing. When we look at this, we're looking at uh, the, the chamber that's inside that basically gives you a short circuit or makes it hot or cold inside the car or makes it hot or cold for the battery, all in one little blob, as it were. And as Benny said, there's a lot of things that kind of look like, maybe, uh, that there's, there's, there's something different here, something different. This doesn't look quite right for, uh, for uh, a North American, or sorry, any car company. And that's when we start looking at this. These are the, um, these are the uh, uh, manifolds that, uh, that we found inside. These things fit together like a glove. And, and quite frankly, the, uh, the, the way that these things are manufactured are, are, are absolutely brilliant. The costing uh, for this is much, much less than, than what you'd see for something other than that. If we look at a conventional car company, we're looking at dozens and dozens of pieces all over the different uh, parts of the car to try and do what these three parts are going to be doing, or three, three, this, this sub-assembly is going to be doing in one area inside the vehicle. If we look at, like Benny was talking about the electronics, if we look at the electronics, the, the difference between this and what was in the Model 3, only one difference really, and that is the improvements. They made improvements to this a DC DC converter and they also made the improvements on the model 3 if you buy a model 3 they don't care about you know only big changes come in at model year they make changes all the time and they don't care about what model year came out they don't they don't care about it they changed everything and then we start looking at this and it's not hard to see that uh, where it used to be an Nvidia chip it's a Tesla chip they designed it themselves vertical integration. As Benny said, they are doing a fabulous job at moving, moving up the food chain because they don't want to have to pay somebody else. Uh, they don't want to pay that profit. They want to keep the profit in-house. People say, oh, it can't possibly be right. We've been criticized for our costing and whatnot. But you know what? Our costing is accurate because what we're doing is we're costing a chip like that. We reverse engineer these things. So we're, co we're costing this chip not by what NVIDIA would sell it for, but what it costs to manufacture. That's why, that's why a lot of the costs on the Tesla are different than what internal people will, will discuss and say, well, no, it can't cost that, it has to cost this, because they're thinking it's bought from the outside. There's a thing called a scotoma. Basically, it, it means that it's a blind spot. It's, uh, it's something where uh, the information that you're giving me doesn't match anything in my head, so it can't be right. That kind of stuff is what's happening to the car companies. They can't, they can't figure it out. It doesn't make sense to them. And that's kind of what we see here with the, uh, with the, the, the problems associated with the, uh, uh, with the car companies now trying to move ahead. So right here we have the, the Tesla Model Y and the Tesla Model 3 battery. The, uh, the chips that go on to these boards are similar, 
but not quite the same. The, uh, the, the manufacturing is similar, but not quite the same. The, um, the batteries are similar, but not quite the same. They, these guys are continuously fooling everybody on how things are done in the, at the, in the Tesla mode, at the Tesla way of doing business. So let's look at one of the aspects that I think is just absolutely staggering. If we look at the high voltage wiring for the Tesla Model 3 over there, that one cable does it all because everything else is integrated. As Benny said, their, their, their engineers and whatnot work as a team coming together. Even the guys over here, because we know that on the, uh, we know that on the octo valve, there was a lot of stuff that was done by the, uh, uh, by the engineers over at uh, SpaceX. That, that's a big deal. Having somebody design it, it looks more like a circuit board than it does uh, a, a mechanical uh, device. Same thing is true here. Everything was in the electronics bay, so that one cable does everything. And unfortunately for the Chevy Bolt, those are the cables you need to have in order to do what this is doing. These kinds of things hold everything back. And now, I, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about batteries. The one thing I am going to talk about is the magnets. So, and these things are really uh, touchy, so I'm not going to get too close. Um, but anyway, you'll see here that this magnet is broken. Um, and that is because um, this is a new style magnet that they're using. This, this style magnet is vastly different than this style. And if you look here, you can see that this isn't really one magnet, it's four magnets that are glued together. This thing here is a single magnet, and I think that one of the reasons that they moved to this is because it's less expensive, but it gives you about the same amount of, um, same amount of, of magnetism, if you like. But the, at the end of the day, this one here um, has a tendency to explode, whereas this one um, does not. It's much more rugged. We thought initially that this was uh, something even more special than it was, but it, it wasn't. But if we look, if we look over here, Prior to, uh, to, the model, to the Model Y, uh, the front motor, the induction motor, um, had copper inside. This one is aluminum. So they followed what's going on with Audi and made the change. That reduces the cost, it reduces the weight, it improves the efficiency of the, that whole electric motor. So we're looking at things that are happening continuously at Tesla, continuously making a difference, and the difference for me anyway, is what they're doing um, to get themselves to a vertical integration kind of, uh, kind of opportunity. And again, as Benny just said, they are not really a car company. What they are looking at, I think, is energy and how are they gonna control energy? And quite frankly, I think that, uh, that without a question of a doubt, Tesla is the best energy company, new energy company on the planet. And they will dominate, I'm sure of it. So let me just uh, get back to where I'm supposed to uh, so we can uh, continue the discussion. Thank you so much, Sandy. I completely agree with you. I think the way they are able to work with different team members, it's not a siloed approach, I can see. Yeah. It's about how different teams can work together for one common purpose. For sure, that Octoval that you talked about, design out of SpaceX maybe, but it shows me a common purpose. It's like almost three or four different systems, so heating and cooling functions are being solved. That's an amazing engineering challenge yeah. to solve. Yeah. Absolutely. So I just want to continue from you know, where Sandy left off. My first point was, they're a software company. Second, we understand they're not just about that. They're into manufacturing, they're into the tech space as well. But there's a very important space that Tesla is operating right now. And in my humble opinion, it's a new currency that they're creating and that's in the chip industry. What I want to do here today is, I don't want to bore you all with what are the specifications of each of this. The fundamental question both Sandy and me wanted to answer was, why the hell is he doing it? What's the purpose? And I think the story of that is quite evident in this slide. In my own admission, easily the worst slide I have done, but it doesn't escape the two or three messages that we want to give. And that first message is, you look on the left-hand side, Apple as an organization chose to have their own chips 
buy product lines, whether that's an iPhone, an iPad, an iWatch, or a Mac. Now, you keep the iWatch aside because of real estate reasons. Apple could have chosen to take off-the-shelf products for each of the other product lines, but they didn't. And here's the reason we believe they didn't. Each of these chips was designed not just for the product, but for a use case in mind. Simple, if you look at an iPhone and iPad, no matter what functionalities you bring, if that phone doesn't have the speed or the battery life, then the product is useless. And that was what the chip was engineered for, prolonged battery life and performance speed. Similarly, you look with the iWatch, it was about cellular connectivity and Bluetooth, enhanced. And you look with the iMac, especially with the recent announcement, it's all about security. And that's how you need to look at this. Forget the word full self-driving chip, but think about a high-performance computer. This high-performance computer serves only one and one core reason. And that is what Tesla is today all about. They didn't start this way, but today they chose to be that, is to advocate the case of autonomy or autonomous driving solution. And that is what this chip does. I think very interesting what Sandy mentioned is there's a lot of respectful companies out there, and please don't get us wrong. But in all likelihood, what we see in the market today, the word is not off the shelf. They're generic products because they meet the generic needs of their wide customer base, not the specific use case of one particular OEM. And that's what you have to look at as this high performance computer. It's the currency that they chose to create to achieve the use case in the edge case. But there's something very interesting as well that we found out is now if you look at the Model 3, I think it's the first electric vehicle to have the 250 kilowatt per kilometer power consumption. That's unique because what this high performance computer does <coughs> on top of that is improve the efficiency of all the powertrain components that Sandy just showed you. Now, whether that's the battery, enhanced range, whether that's the motor, peak performance, these high performance computer chips have a say in that. It's improving the efficiencies as we speak. And for me, that's an important takeaway, not just because of what he's choosing to develop, but why he's trying to address it. But there's something more important that the automotive industry needs to understand. And that is this slide. And I apologize to James Wang for not uh, having his permission, but you will understand it's for a better cause. And the cause is, Look at the medium that they chose to communicate, and that was Twitter, and what he chose to communicate. He chose to communicate the full self-driving chip versus an ACC of a competitor. In reality, no basis for comparison, but he chose to drove it, dry, uh, communicate it. And that's the point we want to make. Consumers in the future, why go to the future? I would say even today, will go beyond just range and performance characteristics. They are being exposed through the Tesla advocates to many new currencies that is going to affect that the way they're going to choose their vehicles. And here's the disruption. We think Tesla is creating those currencies. This is just the start. It's not just about range and performance. There are many more quadrants, many more variables that you will need to start compete and own and communicate. And this for us is the fourth point that we want to mention because all of this is great, but he's a great, he's got a great business acumen too. And we discussed this at large with Sandy. And Sandy's point is absolutely correct. And that's why we call it a networked energy company. This is less about automotive, but more about using the biggest asset that they own, which is the batteries to penetrate and attack various industries. And for me, that has implications two ways. It's about new data business models and how new divisions can be formed. So the slide is trying to explain what we believe is the auto bit of software platform. Long story short, it's the ability that once you license this, any utility, any businesses, any consumers can operate as a utility by providing access to generation forecasting, load optimization, smart bidding, and so on. Why this is interesting for me is, this is now using their existing customer bases 
to venture into new B2B models. Something very interesting happened two months ago. I don't know if many of you are aware of this, but Tesla filed for a license in UK. And that license was to operate as a utility company. It's interesting because it's not surprising. They're already in the home energy uh, division. They're in the energy storage division. But the mode to enter into this was really through the auto mirror software. And I find that interesting because if you look at the right hand side of the slide, this is why we must understand the relevance of Tesla Incorporated and not just Tesla Motors. Because if you see a Tesla motor, all the naysayers see is the red line on their profit and loss statements. Of course, that's not been the story over the last four quarters. But when you look at this, you would have discarded Amazon 15 years ago. It took that much time for the Amazon e-commerce to generate revenue, little realizing that the cash generation comes from another entity, which is AWS. That is simply the way you need to look at Tesla Energy. Till the time Tesla Motor is profitable, through the gigacasting operations that uh, Sandy mentioned, through the gigafactories that is going to come inside, those number of batteries, those huge OPEX uh, costs that he's going to reduce, the Tesla Energy is their entity. I, I read in that Q2 statement, he talks about it being the same size as Tesla Motor. I think it has the potential to be two size, two times the size of Tesla Motors. And for me, that is important, not just for the survival of Tesla Motors, but Tesla Incorporated. And that's the third point we want to talk about is, there is an entity which we believe is Tesla Mobility. And in a very small way, that is what he talks about from a robot or a taxi application. But I want to step back and see how both Sandy and me started this presentation. We started by saying it's a networked energy company. Because you look across each of these three bubbles, there is only one common denominator. And that's the battery. And it's how he chooses to operate those batteries in three or four different industry verticals. You know what, I'd like to make one little comment Absolutely, here. Absolutely, Sandy. Production, a prediction, I should say. So, <clears throat> Monroe Associates, uh, we do a lot of work in the automotive industry. We also do aircraft and defense. But we also work on mining equipment. And uh, I'm not sure how many people know this, but for the past few months, we've seen all these different little things coming out um, that Tesla is looking for someone that can come up with a faster way to mine nickel, okay? Uh, and, and quite frankly, if they owned, the, if they went and bought, say, so there's a huge mine in Sudbury, nickel mine, um, and it's owned by Valet out of uh, Brazil. And if, if you may have uh, looked at uh, the news uh, that comes from the world, um, Valet had some serious issues. They had dams break and people were killed. It was, it was really a disastrous year for them they may be looking for selling a few of their assets. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I think the first asset that maybe Tesla would like to try and get into is the mining of nickel, which helps them with their battery. That's one of the, that's one of the ingredients. But the big thing I think is uh, sitting there lurking in the weeds is I believe that, uh, that uh, Elon Musk is probably gonna go out and buy a, um, a lithium mine I think he'll start with one, but I think what he's going to do is buy one in every country that he possibly can that'll allow him to do the mining, the refining, and then the implementation of that lithium into his batteries. I don't see, um, I don't see the, the, the connection between just, uh, just having batteries and making them in a gigafactory. I don't see that connection to the way he's done everything else. What I'm looking at is someone who does not believe not at all, in uh, buying things off the shelf or, or having somebody buy this uh, as a, cost, a commercial off the shelf kind of a product. I don't, I don't see that at all. I don't think he's into offshoring. I think he wants to keep everything tight. Hence the reason for battery plants all over the world. And even, uh, even uh, double, double timing it here in the United States. So I think that what you're looking at is someone who's gonna dominate uh, the industry uh, similar to the way GE did. When I was a kid, GE made everything from light bulbs to jet engines to nuclear power plants. They made everything. Now they make nothing because they went from a company that was innovative and definitely didn't believe in, um, 
in core competency because they, they basically thought that we can do anything. And I think that that's what Tesla is right now, or at least Elon Musk is. I, I think that's the, uh, the spread that we're looking at here in order to make sure that that uh, strategy for the data uh, a business model, I think that's what's next on the bubble. That's the, well, yeah. it's actually, really, it's down there on the uh, bottom there where it says one mega entity. I, I agree with you. I just <coughs> want to add to one point that Santi mentioned. When we say vertical integration, the conservative automotive industry usually takes it another way. There's something else that we believe makes this guy go after the vertical integration, and that's the first principles. Mm. His approach to anything, not taking it just for the cover, but approaching it from the first principle, is therefore what he chooses to vertically integrate. You know, he doesn't choose every single product. <clears throat> there are very strategic choices in what he makes. Now, whether that's going to be the glass, whether that's the seats, or even the chips, there are strategic reasons that goes behind it. And I completely agree with Sandy because for us, that's the basis of Tesla mobility. Because on one side, while you have energy production and then you have sustainable transportation, you have to think about a sustainable service model because it is for the consumers of the mass. And for me, that is what Tesla mobility is. And in a lot of way, I believe how he's going to attack the European market. Don't get me wrong, right now in the US, it is a lifestyle product. Right, Elon in his own as admission has said, he hasn't reached an affordable point where he can take it out to the masses. But that's how he's going to attack the European market, by flipping the very word, which is total cost of ownership. Because now when you have a vehicle, which is almost in certain components engineered for a million miles, you have a vehicle whose peripheral design has never changed fundamentally. I think the only vehicle mod that doesn't have a model year I think every other OEM mm -hmm. has a model here. I've never seen, uh, except for the changes in the fish beak design. I don't know if that's what they call it. The only thing that has ever constantly changed is the user interface. Now, the customers look at this product in a completely different way. For a product whose physical design doesn't change, user interface does. But now you're incentivized by the Tesla network, not based on the upfront cost of the vehicle, but about how a customer can recoup almost 70% per mile if put in the Tesla network is a very big incentive for customers to consider. And guess who the big customers in Europe are? They will be the fleet customers. And these fleet customers, their calculation will no more be based on an Excel model. It will be taking into these new business activities that they can take. And for me, that's what makes this very interesting and the whole concept of the data business model. So really, I think we talked about a lot of things and we really want to save time for a Q&A. Hopefully there will be some Q&A, Sandy. But this is that one slide that we really want to summarize <coughs> what we want to tell, right? There were seven key themes in each of this. What we really emphasized, and I want to say this with equal weightage, both Sandy and myself, is we talked about Tesla's differentiation being a ground up operating system. And the ground up operating system is the stimulus for movement from a hardware to a software model. But I think most importantly, user interface, user experience. And the rationale behind that was to unlock new cases. Now, of course, guys, the key we want to mention over here is, this is our construct of all the evidences that we have in our, in our vicinity. And for me, those two factors come very importantly in what we call as the cyber truck derivatives. We believe that there's going to be at least two derivatives of the cyber truck. And why this is important, the efficiency gains of the full self-driving chip will then be put into a new environment, which we call as the B2B robot delivery market. Now you just have to think, why is Amazon investing in Rivian? And why is Amazon investing in Zooks. They're both after the same market. And for me, the competition between Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk, it's legendary. It even goes to the space programs. But I think he's got an edge here. And I mean Elon. That is because unlike the other OEMs that will need to partner with an Uber, that will need to partner with a Lyft, Tesla has their customer base. And that's what we call as the B to C to B model because through the attraction of the unlimited mile warranty, 
through new ways how consumers will look at TCO, his way to B2B is to reach his ever-growing fleet of Tesla customers. And for me, that is very unique because we didn't talk about this much and hopefully if we do get a chance, we will. The organization structure of Tesla is absolutely agile. Everything that Sandy just talked about and touched about, there's data that's constantly fed back in effective decision making. And for us, that is what Frost and Sullivan and Monroe believe is the end game. We believe they are creating a Tesla control tower. There's no better way to define it. Because as soon as you think about a control tower, you think about an airport control tower. It's not far off. Because what that control tower is trying to do is to attack three customer bases of Tesla. One, the B2C customers, where it helps customers like Hopefully, Sandy, you will drive. You will have a full self-driving car. Mm. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. oh, he's already torn it down here. Yeah. But it's to allow those customers, no matter what environment they are in, to switch between a human-driven car or a passenger-driven car. Sorry, a, 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 a robot-driven car. And then attack the second layer, which is B2B, as I mentioned to you, which is a, a robo-delivery market. But in my opinion, attack the biggest customer base that there is going to be. And that's the city. And the reason why I say that is think about it. Cities are the ones that are faced with challenges with respect to sustainable energy, sustainable transportation. Where do they put their next set of money in terms of infrastructure? And that, in my opinion, is almost like a golden triangle where Tesla Energy, Tesla Motor, Tesla Infrastructure will be for that and attack the biggest customer there is going to be cities. You think about it, currently there are players like Siemens, etc. that operate in that space. Tesla as a network energy has the potential to attack those, but very simply use their existing customers today as the launch basis. So there's a lot of things, you know, uh, we did it, but key thing that we want to mention is it's not easy to replicate what Tesla does. And it'd be insane for us to tell you, replicate what it is. But for sure, both Sandy and me wanted to raise some red alerts. Is, and, and, and whatever we showed right now is only the tip of the iceberg. There are several elements and, and that passage will come over time. We believe the automotive industry, of course, they believe they have to go from the distributed to the centralized architecture system. But how to do it, in what phase, with the cost base in place, they have to plan this effectively. We believe we have the antidote in terms of what those building blocks are in order to achieve it. You look at the case platform, this is very important and hopefully, uh, you know, if, if everyone has enjoyed this, that will be our next show in terms of platforms. We believe there are new emerging business cases that this platforms can do. And for me, Tesla is defining that. It's not just about the physical asset of the battery and the skateboard. It is now about the E&E architecture and the software that he can now compound into what we call as case platforms. Long story short, I think the automotive industry need to consider the boom model. And what I mean by that is, when do they choose to build? When do they choose to own, operate, and when to maintain? You will have to work with the best in the industry but at what time stage do you transition towards owning the most important asset? So for us, there's several things more we can do, we want to tell. And I hope, you know, on behalf of Sandy and myself, you really enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed presenting it. But now we want to leave some space. We have a good 15 minutes that we want to uh, ask the audience if they have any questions. But Sandy, once again, many thank you for having us. Oh, no. Maybe a fist <clears throat> bump is due, right? No, we can do that. Yeah. We can do that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> so. All right. Question for both. Is it worth creating a gigafactory in Western Australia for being close to the lithium, nickel, and raw materials for car and battery production? Uh, isn't the big battery in Australia? I think that was the test battery, the huge uh, operation. Um, they have put their uh, energy storage over yeah, there. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, Australia is definitely um, the kind of place where if uh, maybe they don't want to have a gigafactory, it would be a great place to start doing some mining uh, because Australia Absolutely. is loaded with, uh, with uh, 
basically the uh, raw materials and elements that they need uh, for, uh, uh, for a gigafactory or for the battery technology that they have. One other thing that Australia's got is uh, they have um, a fair amount of um, um, rare earth materials. And um, what we found in uh, assessing and analyzing some of the, especially of the aluminums, um, uh, they do their own aluminum development they have their own uh, their own special formulas for the uh, for the for the housings and and whatnot uh, that are refractive and reflective. <laughs> we never saw that before, and quite frankly, the the amount of, of element is small. So it it first off it escaped us. Uh, second time or the third time that we went back to have a look because spectrometer analysis didn't quite work, we found rare earth materials in it. Actually, the uh, the mega casting um, isn't, that's the other thing that Tesla does. It leads people down the primrose path. Yeah. So Elon said that that, uh, that casting was made out of a 3.5X. It's really 386. Um, that, that aluminum is, uh, is really and truly perfect for that because then you don't have to have secondary operations. Hence the reason that the Model Y is, has less cost than the Model 3 that we analyzed in uh, uh, 2018. Two years made a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I would add to what Sandy said is, yeah, I believe it's a logical next step. Yeah. And the reason is not just because that's the place where he's invested his energy storage, he's worked with the government to provide that. Uh, uh, but I think more importantly, I do know that there are going to be five gigafactories in the future. And you will have to look at it from two perspectives, either that drives Tesla vehicles but that drives Tesla energy. For me, the Australia is a perfect Tesla energy model. Mm. So I completely agree with you. Uh, yeah. Go for it, uh, Sandy. Uh, question for the both. Um, what's your estimate for feasibility and timeline for actual full, oh, it's already done, full self-driving technology? Just assume there will be no legislative barriers. Yeah. Yeah. I read the last part first. And <laughs> When it comes to legislative barrier, barriers, uh, this is like, uh, who can tell? But anyway, go ahead. That's so my it. statement is going to be controversial uh, because there are two schools of thought to approach autonomy. I see the current client base that goes with autonomy having, of course, the sensor suits, but having high definition mapping and LIDAR solutions. That's, it's interesting, it's a unique way, but I don't believe it's agile enough. And that's where I contrast this with what Tesla does. I don't believe in the statement that he, that he is hardware ready, but I do believe in the software mentality that he has. That is a sensor-based approach, and he's shown this through evidence, <clears throat> that through cameras, you can detect depth. And he's done it as good as a LiDAR can do it. It's, it's, it's available, you can see it. So if you take the legislative barriers alone out, I still don't think full self-driving as how SAE5 classifies it will be achievable. I think this is going to be more geolocalized in my opinion. Well, uh, the, uh, yeah. the way that people are looking at it is a little different than we looked at it when yeah. we were fooling around. We had uh, developed a, 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 an airplane called the Paradigm. <clears throat> and if you flew the Paradigm, you didn't have to be a pilot. Basically, all you had to do was be able to talk. And, um, and in essence, what happened there was um, you would tell the airplane, um, the airplane knows where you are, geo-positioning, um, and uh, you tell the airplane, I, ne I need to go to Chicago, I want to land at Pewaukee Airport. The, uh, the, the aircraft itself would, uh, would digest that information, figure out a flight path yeah. that would keep you away from banging into uh, mountains or, uh, or bad weather, and would take you to Pewaukee, get you into the circuit, and land your aircraft. And we did, um, we worked with a, a company, Fuji, Japan. And with uh, Fabot, we did, uh, I don't know, hundreds, maybe a thousand takeoff and landings, and I don't know how many hours of flight time using that, that philosophy. So if I can do it with an airplane, why can't I do it with a car? Um, I don't see much of a difference. The only thing that we needed was um, we need to have sometimes we had to have control towers every once in a while so that we could be okay. dead accurate. So within an inch or two. That, that kind of stuff is easy enough to put in place, and uh, that would be a legislative barrier that basically could remove yep. um, all the other problems associated with, uh, with full self-driving technology. 
Absolutely. Musk big on creating manufacturing mode. Um, where areas will and should he focus on? That is your question, Sandy. Uh, it's a manufacturing question. <clears throat> yeah, well, um, I know that, um, I know that uh, everybody's probably heard of the uh, mega castings. Um, and um, we already made mm. a couple of suggestions. As soon as we pulled it apart, the first suggestion was, why don't you just get two machines and, um, and shoot the whole thing in one part? Um, and as luck would have it, from what we've been able to figure out, that's on the, uh, that's on the table right now. In the fact, second, on his Q2 statement, he said it's already deployed in Fremont, the single piece casting. It really? That's what he said in his Q2 statement. I did not know that. Yeah, well, there you go. So mm. uh, again, um, we're making statements that he's already gone in for. And now mm. the obvious one is why don't I make uh, the front of the vehicle um, a one piece casting as well? There's no reason why I can't do it. Mm. None whatsoever. I mean, I can build in the crash worthiness just as they built into the rear. I can put it into the front. And if I have one giant casting in the back, one giant casting in the front, look at all the bits and pieces. You're looking at, uh, you're looking at hundreds of pieces that had to be welded, different materials, on and on and on and on. So you start looking at something that we did like on the BMW um, i3, where you've got basically a safety cage. That, that safety cage is, uh, is where the people sit, right? right? And the rest of it um, is disposable. I think that uh, I think that's a brilliant way to go. We've talked to people about it in the past, like years and years ago, but it was always, oh no, we can't do that, and yet he's doing it. So, a manufacturing moat mo for him would be um, <clears throat> definitely an obstacle for the rest of the world because there's only two companies that I know of that can make these uh, these uh, uh, die casting machines, and there's only a few uh, die casting specialists that can can make the molds that they go in. So. Yeah, it's a moat. Should an auto manufacturer design its own OS, if possible, or simply buy a third-party OS? I think that I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, this is my opinion. I think <clears throat> don't look at the ends as to what Tesla achieved, but look at the means to the end. And why I say that is Tesla worked with the best. They have worked with NVIDIA to understand what the best full self-driving chip should be. Very, very long ago, they worked with Daimler and Toyota to bring about the best in Model S and in the Model X. And that, in, in, in retrospect, is the answer to this question is, you have to work with the best in the industry. So yes, ultimately, you need to operate and own the operating system, but you need to work with the best that can help you bring that competency. And that's what I love about the Volkswagen Microsoft approach. Because if you have read the hidden statements behind it, especially from the cloud OS, Microsoft's role is also to train the Volkswagen engineers to run that mm. in subsequent time. So the best answer, if you don't own the operating system, forget about owning the customer experience. So eventually you should, and the way to do that is what we call as the boom. Build, co-create, operate, own, and then maintain. So, so the one thing that I'd like to add to that is, um, we have a philosophy here when we, when we help people design product, mm -hmm. and that is, uh, it comes from a guy named uh, General Sun Tzu. Long time ago, um, kind of general in China, and basically he's classified as the best general that ever lived. Um, and he said, um, if you uh, understand your enemy and you understand yourself, you'll win every battle, okay? And if you understand yourself, but you don't understand your enemy, then you're in a 50-50 kind of situation. Mm. And if you don't understand yourself and you don't understand your enemy, you'll lose every battle or you're always in peril. I believe that, uh, I believe that what uh, the, the folks at Tesla have done was they've taken that to heart. So first they go out, we would call it benchmarking, but knowing your enemy, and then knowing what I can do inside, and then not just in one felt swoop create a, a new operating Absolutely. system, but but figure out how I can blend this together over time. And I think that's what they've done. So they're, uh, they're following General Sun Tzu as opposed to um, folks who uh, come out of uh, other, other areas in business. They're definitely paying attention, <coughs> Sandy. Yeah. There's a lot of questions. So right. they're definitely paying attention. Okay, so maybe let me ask a question. What is the reason traditional OEMs haven't adopted 
Tesla's design model. The auto industry is filled with incredibly intelligent people. Why do they not adopt the same model? I think maybe there's two ways I can summarize it. We don't need a lecture on it. You need to take a certain amount of risk. And to be honest, in this industry, as a benchmark, <coughs> there's no other company that does risk at a level that Tesla does. But there is a second and most important voice, and that's always in Monroe, uh, Sandy, you are the expert at this. It always comes down to existing cost base. Mm. It's difficult to let go of legacy, and that's compounded by a supplier base that keeps prophesizing the same thing. These are just my independent observations, Sandy, but yeah. maybe you have done all this cost benchmarking. Yeah. You can throw a better light. Well, I can tell you, because I worked at Ford um, as an engineer and then later a manufacturing engineer and then a product design engineer, <clears throat> and then finally I wound up in, um, uh, in finance staff, uh, ac actually at World Headquarters. And I can tell you that the main reason it's difficult to do what Tesla does is because there are silos of activity all across every organization. Right. And crossing the barrier uh, between even manufacturing to product design, <laughs> There's a lot of rules, and those rules, um, they, they, they keep uh, innovation in a lot of cases out of the picture. Yeah. Um, and then when you start looking at, well, do I want to go and invest in, say, a mega casting and buy these huge machines that, that cost a million, tens of millions yeah. of dollars? Do I want to do that, or why don't I just weld up a couple more parts? Or better yet, I'll just buy it from China or I'll buy it from wherever. And I've always said that cheap always loses. Um, and the focus there is, if you, if you find that it's cheap financially for that purchase, in a lot of cases, you've missed the boat because it's only cheap today. Tomorrow, it's going to come around and, uh, and bite you in the tail. And this is a good example of what's happening. So I think, um, I think that uh, personally, I think that uh, the auto industry is going to have a tough time um, breaking down the cultural barriers. It's easy to make a technology change. It's tough to change I culture. Agree, yeah. Yeah. And just to give you an example of that cultural change, you just, the teardown <clears throat> of your battery is the best example. Yeah. I haven't seen a battery module that has that kind of snake uh, cooling chamber. Yeah. It touches almost 80%, if not 90%, of the surface of every single battery in that. That's right. not something I see the other players replicate. And that's because the core need for them was BMS, efficiency. So I, I agree with you. I think it's a level of legacies they have well, to battle as well. The other thing about the battery pack is that um, in 2008, 18, when we, uh, when we analyzed the Model 3, um, we, we had it uh, around, uh, I think it was like $135 uh, a kilowatt hour. Uh, for that battery pack. But Tesla's made a lot of improvements and a lot of changes. Um, like I said, the cells are not quite the same. They're the same size, but they're not quite the same. So now we're looking at something where, <clears throat> I, I, I don't want to misspeak, but it, it was either, I can't remember now, it's either 108 or 110 uh, uh, per kilowatt hour. That, that's a big change. You know, we were talking before about the... Uh, about the, uh, um, you know, the, the total cost of ownership. Right. That makes a big difference. Absolutely. And then people say, well, it, it, it's going to be really difficult uh, to get it below 100 bucks. But in two, in two years, I watched them drop the price, I you know, by, uh, by $25. I, I, think, uh, I think that there's, uh, there's every opportunity here to, um, uh, uh, to, to have the OEM start seeing you know what, maybe we need mm. to uh, go in here and try something new. Maybe we need to know uh, a little bit more than we are. Either that, or they're going to have to start buying uh, battery packs from Tesla, which is, I think, the ultimate goal of Tesla, to have everybody using their logical, battery packs. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's a logical step to take. Yeah. Okay, I'm just looking at time. Uh, we maybe have time for maybe one or two questions more. Uh, so this is from Ronnie. How does Tesla Gigafactory model substantially differ from an ICM, ICE OEM factory, which would give Tesla a manufacturing advantage. I mean, I have my views, Sandy. Okay, so a Tesla Gigafactory uh, model is, um, um, you're, you're not quite a comparing yeah. apples to apples there, uh, because um, I assume when you say an ICE OEM factory, you're looking at the engine and transmission. 
um, and that should be basically compared to the um, that should be basically compared to the electric motor and uh, and basically the gearbox that comes in. And quite frankly, the electric motor and gearbox is uh, I mean you could build that product um, um, in this factory right here. I could make those. Um, whereas uh, uh, an engine plant is huge, and uh, and a transmission plant to go along with it is huge, and then the cost associated with the uh, the two facilities is gigantic. And then on top of that, I can automate some of the things that are done inside of an engine plant or a transmission plant, but I can automate everything in a in an electric motor. Uh, there's there's nothing to it. So if we looked at the Tesla Gigafactory, we would make changes to that design slightly uh, in order to, uh, the battery, in order to uh, make it so that it would be a little in, le less expensive to, uh, to manufacture. Um, we'd still probably do the stitching the way they've done it, but, mm. but at the end of the day, there's ways that we think uh, you could bring the price down. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, um, uh, mostly what we've been doing is talking with... Um, battery manufacturers that are, are trying to just change a little bit. They, they, they don't want to do something dramatically yeah. different. So. I agree. I mean, you can't compare an EV with an IC. I, I completely agree with Sandy here. But I think a distinct advantage for those, I've at least just been able to see it on YouTube, is their approach and, and absorbing industry 4.0 concepts at very several stage gates in the manufacturing. But that's a discussion for another day. Yeah. Maybe we can take the last question of the day today. Oh, your favorite topic, Sandy. Oh, boy. Well, the Cybertruck body is 3XX stainless steel <clears throat> and shaped using metal brakes. What extra cost would be involved in the welding of said steel? Mm. And what would be the best method of welding? TIG welding is about it when it comes to, uh, to uh, uh, stainless steel. And I heard that there are some changes to the stainless steel that they're using. Um, there really isn't much extra cost. It's just a little slower. Um, this will be, again, robotically, you basically take the bits and you put them into um, a clamp-up fixture and then um, you basically go to it. Once it's clamped up um, and it's in a single fixture, I'd weld the whole thing up. It, it really wouldn't be a, a giant uh, departure from, from the way we do things now. It's just that we wouldn't prob they wouldn't probably use spot welds. They'd use TIG right. welding to, yeah. uh, to uh, stitch it together. Yeah. Hopefully you get to ride the Cybertruck yeah, through a so personal I'm, I'm invitation. Yeah, looking forward to yeah. the, the Cybertruck. Um, and uh, I want to see what it looks side by side to do the Rivian and the Cybertruck. It'd be a great, uh, uh, a great for uh, some of our viewers on, uh, on uh, Monroe Live, our YouTube standard. Absolutely. But it would be a great, great time to make, uh, make a comparison between those two vehicles. Absolutely. I mean, for us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this really uh, is the end of the Tesla presentation. What we want to tell you is what we, or Sandy and me, described today is the tip of the iceberg. We personally invite you to come and have a tour of this premises. There's so much that you can learn from this. And I think very interesting, if you look at the last slide that I mentioned, which is about what are the different steps that you need to be cognizant about, that's where both Monroe and FNS can really help. So thanks all for your time today, ladies and gentlemen. And it was a big honor. So, but Sandy, thank you once again thank for you. hosting us. Thank you. Well, that worked out fine, I think. Thank you, man. I did.